So now let's talk about a really important joint random variable that comes up all the time in electrical engineering, and that's called the jointly Gaussian random variable. Remember we talked about how Gaussian random variables could be used to model uh, noise and all sorts of real world systems? Well, the PDF of that in 1D kind of looked like the spell curve. So we kind of know in advance that the PDF in 2D is going to kind of look like a kind of a hill rising up from the 2D plane. Okay, and so here I need to specify the mean and the variance. Here there are more things to specify, right? There's basically going to be the mean of x and the mean of y, and then there's going to be a sigma in this direction and a sigma in that direction, and even one more parameter. So let me write down all the stuff that we're going to need. We will need the mean of x and the mean of y. We will need the sigmas, which are the standard deviations in x and y. And then we're going to need this new parameter, rho. So rho is going to be some number between minus 1 and 1. And this is called the correlation coefficient. And don't really worry about what that means right now. We're going to come back to what that means in a couple lessons. Okay. So the PDF is going to be a little bit messy. And I think it's easiest first to write it out in terms of a, whoops, in terms of a um, kind of a matrix vector looking thing, which is generally a nice way to write things in the first place. So let me write this all down first. Luckily, I have enough space to put it all in. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. I went off the page here a little bit. So this is a 2 by 1 vector, but I'm transposing it. So it's like a 1 by 2. This sigma is a 2 by 2 matrix, and this is a 2 by 1 vector. So really, there's just a scalar up here in the numerator. What is this sigma? The sigma is defined as this combination of the various standard deviations and also the row. And this is sometimes called the covariance matrix. Okay. So this is kind of like in a matrix vector product form. If you want to think about it just like expanding it out into raw values, then things get a little bit messier. So if I want to write it out in extreme detail, it's the following. I have 1 over 2 pi, sigma x, sigma y, square root of 1 minus rho squared. That's like the constant in front of everything. And then I have times e to the minus 1 over 2, 1 minus rho squared. And then what's in the exponent? I have a part that only depends on x, a part that depends on everything, And then I have a part that depends only on y. OK, so it's a mess, right? One thing to notice immediately is that if rho equals 0, then a lot of stuff is easier, right? So this part goes away. This is just 1 over 2. And then I can decouple the x part and the y part. So one thing to note is that if the correlation coefficient is 0, actually what I get is the, just the product of two Gaussians, where this is Gaussian with mean and sigma here, and this is Gaussian with mean and sigma there. right? So that's one nice thing is that when, when rho is equal to 0, these things kind of break apart. right? Um, and so let me just show you a couple pictures of what these PDFs look like. Okay. So first, let's think about what happens when um, mu x and mu y are both 0, sigma x and sigma y are both 1, and this rho equals 0, right? So this is like saying I don't have any sort of um, connection between x and y, and what I expect to get is basically a hill that is nicely symmetric in both dimensions. And if I looked at it from the top, what I would see would be kind of like if you're looking at a topographical map, if you're hiking, I would see these kinds of contours, right? And it's easier to see in MATLAB. So let me switch over to MATLAB for a second. So this is the uh, 2D PDF 
of the joint Gaussian. And you can see if I look at it from the top, I get those circular isocontours. And, uh, you know, it looks about what I expect, like kind of just like a nice round PDF. What happens if I were to say, okay, let me still have um, zero means and rho equals zero, but instead let me make um, sigma x equal to one and sigma y equal to two. Okay, that's like saying that the variance in x is one and the variance in y is twice as big. So kind of what I would expect to look at from above would be a, topical, a topographical map where I have ellipses instead of circles, right? That's like saying that things are expected to vary more in y than they are in x. And indeed, if I go back, I'm doing the MATLAB uh, part off the screen, but if I go back and look at that PDF, indeed, this is what I see. So if I look at it from the top, I see exactly those ellipses where things are longer in y than they are in x. And if I twirl it around, I see things are a little bit fatter. You know, it's a, it's a broader distribution looking at it from the y side and a skinnier distribution looking at it from the x side. Okay. What happens when um, rho is not equal to zero? Well, um, if I have, for example, still zero mean, and let's suppose these variances are both equal to one, and now let's suppose that rho equals one half. It's a little bit harder to immediately understand why this happens, so I'm just going to tell you for the moment, and then we'll worry about why it happens later. But what's happening there is I'm going to get elliptical contours that are oriented. So somehow the way I think about this is that rho kind of defines how these random variables are coupled together. And so uh, if I try to draw that picture in MATLAB, what I see is the following. If I look at it again from the top, I can see exactly this diagonal offset I showed you. It's still got this nice shape, and it almost looks like the previous shape, but rotated by 45 degrees, right? And there's a reason why that's true that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, okay? So that's the joint Gaussian. One thing to think about is what would happen if I took the marginals, right? So I, I kind of can immediately see what the marginals are when I've got rho equals zero. Even when I don't have rho equals zero, it seems like if I were to take this PDF and push it onto the x-axis, it looks kind of Gaussian already, right? So there's actually a, a truth to that. So let me just do a quick thing to think about what are the marginals of the Gaussian, okay? So um, the marginals of the Gaussian. Let me like make my life a little bit easier here and say, okay, let's suppose that my means are zero and my sigma is equal to one and my row is arbitrary, right? So that's going to make my life a little bit easier from a perspective of the PDF. The PDF then is going to be 1 over 2 pi square root of 1 minus rho squared, e to the minus 1 over 2 1 minus rho squared. And then I have this part becomes a little bit cleaner. So if you compare this to the previous um, you know, definition, you'll see that all of these denominators with sigmas and so on drop away because sigma is equal to one. So what if I wanted to know what is the marginal in X? So I would take this PDF and I would integrate it. I would integrate out the Y part, right? So then basically, so I don't have to write, write this all again. I'm going to say that my marginal in X is just going to be the integral of this thing dy, okay? which again is not a very appealing prospect, but it turns out that using some cute tricks, I can actually solve for this. So I'm gonna take this part out. And then here is a kind of a cute idea. So I'm gonna have this part, and then I'm gonna write the numerator, oops, I'm gonna write the numerator like this, y squared minus two rho xy plus rho squared x squared minus rho squared minus 1 x squared. All I did was I took this x squared and I wrote it like with an extra rho squared there. What does that get me? Well, what it gets me is I can now take out something that only depends on x, right? The only thing that, that I'm going to take out is this part here. And this rho squared minus 1 cancels with this rho squared minus one. 
So what I get over here is uh, basically e to the minus one half x squared. Then I have an integral. And actually, I'm going to put the uh, one over square root of rho squared into here. What do I have left? I have e to the one over two, one minus rho squared. And then I'm going to write this like y minus rho x squared dy. Okay. So why did I do this? This now is actually in a clever form, right? This is actually a Gaussian PDF with mean equals to rho x. If I think about this as a PDF in y, the mean is rho x and the sigma is square root of 1 over rho squared, right? And I guess I just have a square root of 2 pi in here, so I'll put, I'll put one of the square root of 2 pi's back in here. So this is kind of clever because now I say, hey, this is actually a PDF on its own, which integrates out to 1, right? And that what, what's left is that the PDF in X is just also a Gaussian. So this is like a mean 0 sigma equals 1 Gaussian, right? So what did I learn? I learned that um, the marginal in X is um, basically a Gaussian, a simple one, right? And it actually has the same mean and variance that I would expect. So I mean, if I used these numbers, I would get what I expected. And so that's kind of clever. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the case of conditional PDFs, which I haven't really talked about yet. Um, but it's nice to know that when I marginalize out in a Gaussian, I also get just another Gaussian. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we start talking about conditional probability again.